Most breaches are caused by exploiting oversights and basic cybersecurity fundamentals, but complex hybrid multi-cloud infrastructures make cybersecurity hygiene challenging. Red Seal can help. It shows you what's on your network, how it's connected, and the associated risk across public cloud, private cloud, and physical environments. With Red Seal, you'll get control of your cybersecurity fundamentals so you can protect your organization from the inevitable attack vectors and reduce your cyber risk. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Paul Asadorian and Jason Albuquerque. Register for one of our upcoming webcasts and virtual trainings by visiting securityweekly.com and select the webcast training drop down from the top menu bar and click registration. In our next webcast, we will cut through the marketing buzzwords and teach you about collecting and analyzing logs in hybrid cloud environments with Gravwell. And we will also discuss building better, faster, more secure code by combining static analysis and software composition analysis with Synopsys. Also, Secure World Boston, which was scheduled for March 25th and 26th at the Heinz Convention Center, has been postponed until further notice. We will keep you in the loop as soon as we know more. All right, gentlemen, I pulled some interesting articles this week because if we don't have a little bit of fun, I, I, I think we're all going to go crazy <laughs> uh, with this whole situation right now. So the the first article I brought in, I, I you know, HBR has been doing this um series on real leaders. And mm -hmm. this one stuck out to me uh, this week because this concept of emotional discipline, um, when we think about what's going on right now, uh, I think this is a great lesson. I listened to this entire podcast from beginning to end about Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, yeah. and a lot of the constraint and restraint he had emotionally during a very difficult time in our history. And I thought this was a great podcast for our existing leaders uh, in not only government, but in corporations as we go through this very challenging time uh, with the whole uh, coronavirus thing. Interested on your thoughts, Jason and Paul. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I love this article because, I mean, politics is kind of a, a hobby pastime for me, right? I, I you know, I, I look at political leaders as, um, as folks who, uh, you know, our entire nation should be able to look up to as leaders for this country, right? The, you know, the best country on the face of this earth. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the political climate hasn't really um, allowed for good leaders to bubble up. Um, but I consider President Lincoln one of the best leaders this nation's ever seen. Um, you know, his leadership style is something I've studied. Uh, his political prowess is something I've I've read a lot about and, and studied. And his ability to use language. Um, you know, one thing that I that I, I always say to my team and, and try to teach my team is words matter, right? Words are are a critical tool for leadership. Um, it's something that is can be used to give perspective, context, inspire, motivate. Um, you know, and, and, and honestly, uh, President Lincoln was a master at that. He, he really, really was. And, uh, you know, on the same token, he was a great storyteller, right? I mean, some of his speeches are, are stories. You know, they're, they're, they're beautifully written. Um, they go through the highs and the lows like a, like a story would. And uh, just, just an inspirational leader, speaker, order, um, you know, just, just an incredible politician. Something that politicians today should, you know, aspire to be like. Absolutely. I mean, he was uh, he, he listened to and, and read a lot of Shakespeare. He had a uh, great command of the English language and used it in a very effective way. I mean, his, his speech in Gettysburg um, was 200 like 74 words. Right. And, and one of the most articulate speeches anybody's ever given, probably in the history of the United States. 
in 274 words. He was just a master of the language yeah. in, in telling uh, that story. And it was a pivotal part, uh, a pivotal point in not only uh, the Civil War, but the, the future of our country. And, I, and you know, I, I thought this was a, just a perfect timing. I don't think HBR timed it this way on purpose or anything like that. I think it just happened to hit right at this very critical juncture of where we as a nation sit right now in this crisis. And if people can use this story and kind of Lincoln's leadership, maybe we can be a little better uh, during this crisis. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and and I mean, you know, you're looking at a, a person in President Lincoln that had, what, maybe a year's worth of formal education, but he taught himself so much, right? I mean, if you look at the history of Lincoln, he taught himself how to be a surveyor. Um, he taught himself law. I mean, think about it. He was, he, was an, he was an attorney who tried thousands of cases. I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but, you know, 3,000, like 4,000 cases. It was like 4,000. Yeah, it was like yeah. 4,000 cases. You know, and, and, and taught himself how to be a good orator and public speaker. I mean, that's, that's just amazing. But he was a person who had a lot of grit, a lot of resilience, right? He, he didn't have an easy life, right, growing up. Um, you know, he, he's someone who failed a lot. I mean, if you look at the history of, of, of President Lincoln, he failed a lot. Right. Mm-hmm. So he but but his personality, you know, he was able to evolve and learn, you know, so so that's an incredible leader, someone someone who can evolve as a thinker, evolve as a human, evolve as a leader. Um, that, that's just, you know, something to take note of. Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that ties a little bit into this next article. Uh, I thought this was a really interesting read on the six uh, startup disciplines for challenging times, because we're in a challenging time. We have a lot of small businesses. We have a lot of startups uh, that potentially could struggle during the time frame. And so I thought this was a really interesting article. Kind of list out some of those things to really focus on over this time. And, and number one, and I've been a big believer of this my entire career, transparent communication. Just be transparent. Just get get to the facts. Number one. Yeah, no, agreed. I think I think candor is important, right? Because ultimately, your your staff is going to know if you're not being genuine, um, and and your customers will ultimately know it too, right? So having that level of candor and transparency and just being open and honest um, just just helps build that trust factor. You know, we talk on the show a lot about trust. So you know, something that you want to make sure you're keeping um, strong in the in the in the most difficult times. So being transparent just just helps galvanize that that trust factor. Yeah. You know, Paul and I have been having lots of conversations over the past couple of weeks on, you know, us, right, as a company, because, you know, we're a small business. There's eight of us. Um, we've we've gone to some very interesting, you know, decisions around, you know, most of us are remote, so we can record from pretty much anywhere. Uh, you know, we need Johnny in, in studio to hold down the four. Paul pops in. We've got plenty of social distancing going on uh, between the two studios, so I think we're all good. But we've been, you know, we've we've kind of continued to work with our staff just to kind of, like, here's where we are. Look, if you're uncomfortable coming in, work remote because we can support it. You know, and we've continued to make tweaks in our communication plan to our employees, uh, even to our sponsors, we're still recording. We can effectively record and continue to do what we do as a business remotely. We dial in guests all the time, like our previous segment, right? You're remote today, Jason. So, you know, we can still do what we do, um, not only for our audience, but for our sponsors, uh, which, you know, is it kind of ties into number two, which is gauging you know, your customer health. How are your customers doing mm-hmm. during this transition? We, I've seen a lot of communications from various vendors, from various other businesses saying, hey, you know, stay safe, right? We're here to support mm-hmm. you wherever you need support. Um, you know, just making sure that, that your customers are in, in good shape too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and to be honest with you, you know, getting that level of um, knowledge, situational awareness, let's say, on, on the health of your customers does two things, right? It, it, it helps build that relationship, right? Because you're actually reaching out, making sure they're okay. You know, that's really that customer focus. But it also gives you situational awareness on, on where they would be, let's say, for, for projects with your organization, right? Are, you gonna have, are your projects still going to close on time? Uh, are they going to get pushed out? Um, maybe it's from a, a, you know, an accounts receivable perspective. Do you have to make concessions about cash flow and prepare for that, right? So, so it gives you a lot of different context and information that you can use to properly build a strategy during this time. 
Yeah. Think about this, right? You brought it up. This next point says move away from annual planning to quarterly or monthly. Mm -hmm. Think yeah. about yep. a, a month ago. You were laying out your entire annual plan, all the conferences you were going to hit, and now mm -hmm. a bunch of those have been canceled, postponed, or moved. It's completely changed all of your planning. And this is happening across the board, right? And, and so you've got to mm -hmm. move away from that. What am I doing the rest of the year to just go, what are we doing next this next month. Um, for us, yeah. it's like, what are we doing between now and the end of the month? And then what do we do after that? Right. From a contingency planning perspective, we have to think in much shorter time frames now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. Right. I mean, you know, from, from our side of the house, just what we're doing as an organization, our executive team's meeting every other day at this point. Right. I mean, it, it's something that we want to make sure we're always staying ahead of. Um, you know, where we're having, and again, it's not, it's not, you know, we're not spending three hours together. We're spending a half an hour together going through every single business unit, talking about challenges we may be having, um, you know, information or data that we're seeing, um, giving situational awareness to the other departments and really trying to help each other when we need, you know, when we need to, to kind of rally around a specific initiative or a department. But, you know, having that level of knowledge in, in, in a critical time like this, where we're constantly staying in touch with each other, communicating with each other, um, helping each other out, um, it, it just allows us to be more proactive, right? Because if we were only meeting monthly, um, you know, this will be this will be said and done. It could potentially be said and done, and, and not, we're not ahead of it, right? So, you know, we really want to focus on lead and lag measures um, as often as we possibly can right now. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, that leadership's important. That's the sixth point here on the checklist, mm -hmm. and and allowing the leaders to continue to communicate on a frequent basis, and, and you know really keep everybody updated with what's going on, mm -hmm. kind of timelines around what to expect. Uh, I think very very important during this this time of crisis. Yep. Uh, social distancing. We said, look, Paul and and Johnny are practicing it. They're in two opposite uh, studios. Uh, they were on a Zoom call 10 feet apart earlier today. <laughs> separate bathrooms, different separate coffee makers, <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> right? But if you're stuck at home, what do you do? So, uh, you know, we, we had Vanessa Van Edwards on uh, last year, got the list. It's a bit, it doesn't apply to us, but I thought it was an interesting way to kind of add some levity to the situation. What are the 15 things to do <laughs> so you don't go uh, completely insane during social distancing? Yeah. Uh, the, it, yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, honestly, look. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was going to get to no, one. No, but... I was just going to say, you know, so some of these items here I think would drive me more crazy, so I, I would skip through them. Organizing my photos and creating playlists will just aggravate me even more. So, <laughs> so those are things I yeah. wouldn't do. How about that? <laughs> Yeah, the first one I, I got to clean, to that I well, I'm not going to spring clean. <laughs> yeah, right. The first one I got to that I thought was uh, interesting was spruce up your LinkedIn. Uh, you know, as yeah. professionals, yeah. we we use LinkedIn. Uh, Paul and I use it a lot, obviously, uh, to connect with our audience and, and other people. But I thought that was actually a really interesting one to think about is, you know, kind of update your LinkedIn profile more from a professional perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, we also use Twitter here. So, you know, maybe you got to spruce that up a little bit that this might be a good time to do that yeah Maybe. no absolutely and, and and you know the the part of it that i took was um the training and learning perspective right i mean a lot of us are running a thousand miles an hour we can't always fit in um you know reading a white paper or taking a, a a certification course or something like that maybe maybe this can open up some some time some bandwidth for folks to go out there and get some trainings in read a book um you know just just kind of you know it, it hit that knowledge side of the aisle that that often gets neglected right i yeah, think exactly uh, one thing i i've been doing is exploring all forms of communication so i was telling matt yesterday like i got slack over here and discord over here and I'm mm -hmm. sharing the music that I'm streaming, uh, you know, through both of the chat things so that everyone can tune in. I created a custom hacker music playlist and I hope that gets shared with people. And I'm trying to be, nice. you know, more responsive on the various messaging platforms. I rejoined some chat channels I hadn't been in in some time mm -hmm. um, and just really taking advantage of the, the time. I'm like, well, I'm going to be remote, going to be working from home more often, uh, if not most of the time. And so I got to stay connected with people. So it was a way for me to kind of mm -hmm. rediscover uh, some of those communications uh, mechanisms, 
uh, which is really nice. Of course, Zoom. I've been on Zoom calls with more uh, with more people, and it's pretty funny. Everyone's like like kind of new to Zoom when it's like for us, it's like second nature. Uh, so yeah. yeah. It's good. Right. It's good. And and, uh, turn your camera on. I've been doing that a lot more. A lot of times previously in Zoom, (laughs) I would not turn my camera on largely because I'm on camera like all day long, it feels like. (laughs) And sometimes I just don't want to be on camera. Um, But now that, you know, there's a lot less human interaction, I think, having your camera on. So I've been doing that in every uh, Zoom call, making sure that uh, the camera is uh, turned on. So. Which means he has to put pants on, everybody. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it depends on the camera <laughs> angle, but yeah. Yeah. But you also said you were reading more books, right? So well, yeah, because like, be if I go time. on my phone and I try and read, and like, let's all be honest, the time you read on your phone is when you're in the bathroom. And so I'm like, I can't, uh, I can read on my phone, but every other article, regardless of where I go is about this latest pandemic. And now I, I'm not, that's fine. That is, it is what it is. I'm not knocking that, but there are times when I'm like, I want to read about, uh, I'm building a PC with my kids, right? I want to read my feed for that or whatever. And I just, I can't get to those articles because it's so flooded with COVID-19. And we well, yeah, obviously right. have to read to do articles for all of our shows. And that's becoming difficult as well. So I need like a a switch to like turn those articles on or off. Uh, I know there's companies out there that have AI engines that uh, that can do stuff like that. Uh, and you know, obviously, I wouldn't turn it off completely, right? Because we still need to stay informed. But let's all be honest as well. We know that it breeds anxiety uh, and fear, and and when you read all of that stuff too, so you can't overload yourself with it. That's another thing I do to stay sane is I try and get enough of the news about what's going on to stay informed, but not like bury myself uh, in it because that just makes you depressed and anxious, in my opinion, if you do too much of it. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so get. Get back to paper books uh, or hardcover yeah, books. Yeah, so I bring I bring paper don't... books now with me into the bathroom. That's that's my new because th- they're not talking about COVID nineteen, right? And I do say uh, it's hard to find the actual research on it. I think as as hackers, we're really good at that as a community uh, of finding the truth uh, and the scientific facts. Uh, and you know they are out there. Uh, and I've read, well, I'm sure most of us, right, I've read way more about epidemiology and all this stuff than we care to admit. And there are some great, great sources out there. Yeah, there are. And, and I always kind of go to the truth sites and figure out what's real and, and what's not real. So, yes. Yeah. But yeah, if yeah now you can I, get overwhelmed with it. You have to validate. I mean, now more than ever, we have to validate. It makes me think about how we validate everything that we put, especially on this show and stuff, right? It has to be. Uh, validated. I think it was, that's that aspect of it has put it under a microscope more uh, than ever before. Not just this virus under yeah. a microscope, right? But the truth in the articles we read and separating them also require, I think, more more scrutiny. As we can see from this, one thing is that there's a lot of uh, there's some false information, but there's other information that isn't presenting like all of the different angles to it. And it's interesting. We've done this with a lot of surveys we talk about on the show, right? We talk about the way they present the data and we're like, it's not necessarily false, but you have to take into account these other perspectives and these other facts to kind of uh, define how much weight that that one fact is that they're promoting in this article. And there's just been a ton of that lately. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one one thing I would say that this article, you know, didn't have that that I'm trying to do is is honestly disconnect a little bit and spend more time with my family. That's that's just a little mental health break for me. Um, you know, again, running a thousand miles an hour all the time. Uh, you know, uh, on Sunday, the, the the four of us went out and decided to go find a trail and spend an hour and a half, two hours hiking, hanging out, talking. Right. I mean, the simple things. So oh, that yeah. that's one Absolutely. thing that. Uh, that I, that I made sure we're, we're we're starting to do a little bit more, right? Yep. The the Apple Health app said I walked seven point three miles yesterday. Nice. Because we're getting out, we're you know trying to spend more time with the family and and exercise yep. and and stay healthy, right? During this time and one hundred percent being locked 100%. up in your house is, is not necessarily the best thing either. So you know this as right. long as you're out in your small group and and you've got distance. I think getting outside, getting some fresh air is actually good, mm-hmm. and, and spending time with the family. Absolutely. Yep. 
100%. Yep. Uh, this next article I thought was good because, yes, that meeting could have been an email. Uh, you know, <laughs> we talked last week, Jason, you weren't on, but we were talking a little bit about kind of the uh, some of the guidance for people working remotely or working at home. Meetings, mm-hmm. obviously, is a part of that, but you don't need a meeting for everything. And and so I think we have right. to balance what can be done via email and what needs an actual meeting for, especially in the in virtual meetings being uh, kind of the, the way meetings are happening now. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, I, I would take it a step further in, in what could be a direct message within a collaboration application versus an email, too. Because email is becoming such noise these days that, you know, a, a, at some point, I just feel the need. Now, you know what? I'm not going to write a novel within an email either. I'm either going to, you know, give you a buzz through my collaboration portal or I'm going to ping you. And we're going we're gonna to have a real conversation, right? And actually talk to each other and talk through it. So that way we're not creating 53 threads of an email uh, that we have to scroll through by the end of this, right? So, you know, some of it may just be uh, give somebody a call, have a conversation. Yeah. Well, that's why Paul's got Slack. Signal and Discord on three <laughs> different machines. And I got three monitors at home, right? Here, for whatever reason, I have one because my desk is a lot smaller, actually, because it's one of those sit-stand desks. Uh, but at home, I yep. have three monitors, so I can really, really spread things yeah. out. And so he yep. can stay have connected a video conversation. to us finally. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we do that, too. But those are scheduled intervals. We kind of have our regular routine for those. Outside of that, we don't. It, it, we just use lots of collaboration uh, messaging systems to communicate. So, uh, this next article is tied into my last article. I, I want to talk a little bit about vendors. I, I mean, if we think about supply chain for a minute and the impact to the supply chain, this might be an interesting time for a lot of organizations to kind of reevaluate their vendor relationships. Um, cause this is an interesting test. We were talking last segment a little bit about the business continuity side of what you're going through, Jason, right? And yep. you've got yep. obviously vendor relationships that have to be managed. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, is this something you're looking at, um, as kind of reevaluating the relationships with some of your vendors or things in pretty good shape for you versus maybe yeah, what some I mean, others I, are facing? I, w- I wouldn't say reevaluating. I would put it more toward the line of, making sure we were proactive, right? So, so weeks ago, we were reaching out to our most critical vendors. You know, the ones that we know, uh, we talked about it in the earlier segment, right? I mean, making sure you can, you can prioritize your assets based on criticality. Well, part of our assets is our partners, right? Mm-hmm. And our vendors. So, you know, we look at them as, as an asset to the organization and it's really making sure that your most critical business partners um, are solid from a business continuity plan. plan. And, and, you know, for us, they're not transactional vendors, right? They're, they're, they're partners of ours. So we help each other, right? I mean, we're, we're working to make sure that um, we're, we're both sides of the aisle are going to win and we're going we're gonna to have success, you know, between, between our two companies because the relationship is worth it, right? So, um, you know, getting with them, making sure they were in a good spot, making sure that their business continuity plan was able to execute, making sure we were testing those critical pieces of their business continuity plan well in advance, and, uh, and, you know, and, and really taking it from there. So um, I, I wouldn't say reevaluate. I would say, um, you know, do some level of, of, of testing tabletop, you know, the muscle memory that you've been building by working with them and, and partnering with them. Make sure that you can actually execute on that muscle memory. Yeah, I, I think that ties. I have, a, to... I have like a, I have a craving for hummus now. Johnny's <laughs> notification on his Slack is a lady saying hummus and it's coming through the. Because you must have Slack on one of the computers that the audio is connected. I thought that was really funny. Jason was talking, and I heard a lady say hummus. I was like, what? What is Oh. Oh. <clears throat> oh, is it okay? So just in my, in my head. <laughs> That's awesome. Hummus. It's making Paul hungry now. I am. Now, like, I really want hummus. <laughs> nice. And I was going to say, so, oh. Yeah, so evaluating your vendors, certainly. Uh, and Jason, I wanted to give you props because I think uh, a lot of us don't have a good understanding of and do the threat modeling correctly to know, yeah. oh, oh my God, like if this vendor all of a sudden had issues for whatever reason, like what would what yep. would we do, right? And and so we uh, yeah. started having those conversations as well. Yep. We're like, okay, so as things progress, we can all work remotely. What services and vendors do we need to rely on? And what backups do yeah. we have 
uh, to those vendors as well. It may also make you want to stock extra things in case your supply chain, one of your supply chains goes down. So I tend 100%. to... 100%. I mean, I we, we, hold, were testing, you know, we were testing to the point of, we were testing the point of, hey, let's, let's for a couple of days have your workforce go 50% remote. Yeah. We actually did that ahead of time, mm-hmm. right? So, so for a couple of days, we were actually able to see the traffic and and what it would do to the to to the relationship, and make sure we could, you know, identify any gaps in in in, in service, and just make sure that we were ahead of it, right? I mean, we 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 literally said have fifty percent of your workforce go remote for one of our vendors, right? And let's let's make sure it's solid. So, I, I mean, you know, I, again, so, it's, it's just being ahead. Of, it's ahead of the game, right? It's proactiveness. So I'm, I'm building a gaming PC uh, with my kids, like for the air quotes for the kids, right? It's really kind of dad's <laughs> dad's dad gets yeah. to use it too. Anyway, uh, so we're ordering computer parts, and a lot of uh, I mean, you've seen this on a lot of sites like Amazon. If you go to order food, right, they're putting out notifications right on the website. Like we might have issues getting you stuff, and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm thankful we stockpile a lot of computer parts, right? Because if something fails. If that supply chain is maybe not gone completely, but has a significant lag in getting the things mm-hmm. because people are in quarantine, right? We already saw that with sourcing stuff from China. You need to have contingency plans. And I think we did a Absolutely. decent job of that, but we could probably do even better. I and mean, when we do a lot of that when we go to conferences too, it's part of your threat model. When we go to conferences, I'm like, all right, if this, if an HDMI cable fails, probably we can get one, Right. But if this highly specialized device fails, we're not getting another one. So you know what? We're shipping two with, with the kit, right? Maybe taking one in our bag and shipping one with the kit. So we have um, that. It's a, I like business continuity planning, right? Better than disaster recovery because that's, to me, something different yep. specific to recovery. Right. Uh, this is uh, planning, uh, certainly, for continuity. Yeah. And mm-hmm. making sure the business can stay up and running. Yeah. That's the key. That's the key, right? So, and again, a lot of it could be tabletop exercise. It's muscle memory, right? I mean, for us, it's about practice, practice, practice. You know, I mean, it's 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 that it's that military style, right? I mean, uh, you know, train like you fight. (laughs) That's that's the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, and we've done that kind of thing with our internet connections, right? Like, what if we lose a firewall and an internet connection and a switch? And let's not just tabletop that out. Let's wait till we've got, you know, yeah. a good time to do that. And I've, I've done it here. I've gone and, and pulled, actually do it. Pulled, yep. pulled the cables. And let's make sure yep. that that Zoom call still still happens. Um, yep. So we've done that. Especially with exactly. a webcast coming up this week. Yeah. Absolutely. Make sure everything's <laughs> running. Absolutely. Yeah. We may <laughs> run another one of those tests before then. <laughs> now that you say that. <laughs> Might be a good idea to run it like tomorrow after the shows or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The, the last two articles I brought in, look, I think there are some really um, interesting vendor announcements around providing some tools. I think some are probably a little more fluffy than others. You know, we called out mm-hmm. last week, Paul, uh, Great Horn was doing their email security, mm-hmm. I think free for 30 or 60 days. Sentinel-1 Sentinel was giving yeah. away their uh, endpoint protection. Mm-hmm. There's a few others in the news. I think some of these are really good things. Uh, some of these are like, eh, mm-hmm. maybe. Um, one login is offering their platform free to educators. Uh, uh, so I thought that was interesting. We've got a lot of remote people uh, teaching our kids now. One login making their their stuff free to the educators. Maybe not the rest of the corporate America, but at least the educators. <laughs> uh, no before was offering some training. We were talking about training as a way to deal with social distancing and, mm-hmm. and maybe some learning. Pretty good, yeah. Um, Tenable's, you know, Nessus Essentials, Nessus Home's always been free, so probably yeah, yeah. it's the same, mm-hmm. right? So I'm like, eh, okay, I could always get Nessus Home for free, or now what they call uh, Essentials, probably not that big of a deal. Um, but then there were some other ones in the second article, Cloudflare, free for six yeah. months for any company. Wow. Uh, yeah, which I thought it's great. That's a great announcement, right? People have a lot of remote workers. They're not quite sure how they're going to deal with some of this traffic and monitoring stuff with all these remote workers. Cloudflare says, look, six months for free, any company. Great announcement. Yeah, really yeah I mean, I've been out. impressed with with, uh, with a lot of business, you know, coming out and, and, and just saying, listen, we're going we're gonna to give you the platform. Give it to you for whatever, 90 days, six months, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, the companies have come out in, in force. So uh, I'm proud of it, right? I mean, you have the Cisco's of the world, the Microsoft's of the world. You just yep. mentioned, uh, you know, a, a bunch of companies who came out and just said, here, 
You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through it together. No strings attached. You know, I I love that we're able to rally around and and just have, um, you know, have the pri- private sector jump in and and contribute. It's awesome to see. Yeah, absolutely. In this time of uncertainty for a lot of people, they're not quite yeah. sure how to manage all these remote workers, giving them the tools, yep. making it free, allowing them to get through this crisis. I think that's great for the industry, but it's also a yep. great way to build a relationship that you never had before. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.